Well, it's a pleasure to be here, of course, and I, I want to just lay a little bit of groundwork. In 19, oh, actually 2006, I published a book called Life Beyond 100. That was basically the beginning of my theory that we ought to live a lot longer than we do. The average American lives 78 years, and I figured unequivocally that the reason the average American lives only 78 years is what John Knowles called human misbehavior, the habits that lead to early death. So I go to 42 cities promoting this book, and you know, 100, 200 people come to hear me in each city, and they were all angry with me. People came to hear me talk about life beyond 100, and they're angry. And for the first time in my life, I recognized that Freud the fraud, the man who created more harm for the human race than any other physician in history, the man who was, in my opinion, despicable, had one concept that is close to correct. Among other things, he said, most people have a death wish. Now, Eric Byrne, of course, also wrote that we set the cause and time of death early in life. And he told his inner circle of friends that his life script called for him to die at age 60 of a heart attack. And he did. And I was speaking at the International Association of Transactional Analysis, which he found. And I said, you know, he's a brilliant man. Why didn't he change his life script when he realized that? And one of the psychologists said, but Norm, what better way to prove his point? <laughs> so um, I want to uh, prove another point for today. Basically, I can tell you I don't care how long I live. That's utterly immaterial. I know that at age 12, I read my great-great-grandfather's diary, which was written in the middle 1860s. And sitting there on my great-grandmother's farm, out in the sun, reading that diary, I thought, oh, you know, I'll live past 100. I mean, that was just, now, if that's setting your life script, that's when it happened for me. But basically, I grew up in a family where on my mother's side of the family, nobody died before 90. My great-grandmother, I last visited when she was 101 and a half, and I said, Grandma, how do you feel? She said, Bud, I feel just as good as I did when I was 16. And she was in her kitchen canning, getting ready for winter. And she died actually in her sleep at 102 and a half. My mother only made it to 97. My father, and five of six brothers died between 48 and 54 years of age. My father at 53. Brother number six lived to be 80. He was the only one of the six who didn't smoke. So looking at habits that people have, that was the major factor in five out of six brothers dying over 18 years prematurely. <laughs> Go home and let your dog lick your face. Dog saliva is the most effective antidepressant you can get without a prescription. <laughs> and I would say it's about a billion times better than any antidepressant, but that's another factor. We've exhausted all conventional medicine. So there's another thing down here that says, and so now we're going to try an alternative procedure that is only effective 96% of the time. <laughs> Too bad, the antidepressant didn't work. <laughs> I take aspirin for the headache caused by the Zyrtec, I take for the hay fever, I got for the Lorenza, for the uneasy stomach from the riddle, and I take for the short attention span caused by the Cocoderm TS, I take for the motion sickness, I got for the Lomodal, I take for the diarrhea caused by the Zinacol, for the uncontrolled weight gain, for the Paxil, I take for the anxiety, for the Zocar, I take for my high cholesterol because exercise is a good diet and uh, chiropractic care are just too much trouble. <laughs> and that's the average American. My experience in taking care of 30,280 chronically ill people who have failed conventional medicine, my average patient had had between five and seven unsuccessful operations, not mentioning the basketball court <laughs> of drugs that had failed. And in 1971, when I, 
I, well, actually, in, in November of 1970, I was up at the University of Minnesota teaching, and I said to one of my colleagues, you know, pain is the most common symptom that takes somebody to a physician, but nobody specializes in pain. He said, what an interesting idea, but who would ruin his career doing that? So the next year, I began ruining my career because I felt that what we were doing with drugs and surgery, now you gotta understand, men, most of you may not even know what a chordotomy is, but back in the 60s, as late as, late 60s at least, neurosurgeons went into the operating room for people who had severe pain, it wasn't being controlled by anything, and we took an old single-edged razor blade, sterilized, of course, and we measured the width of the spinal cord, broke off a hunk of that, the sharp part, put it in a little hemostat, a little pair of pliers, lifted up the cord and stuck it in and cut the front half of the cord on one side. That's a chordotomy. It worked. 85% oh, of the time, got rid of the pain for about four years. And then it failed, except in 8% of people. So they had four years of pain relief. 100% of the time, they never had another orgasm. 10% of the time, they were paralyzed on one side. 10% of the time, they had bowel and bladder paralysis. And 10% of the time, they had a new pain called postcardiotomy dysesthesia. It's like the worst pain in the world you've ever thought of. But other than that, you know, <laughs> when that failed, they did a frontal lobotomy. And they stopped complaining about pain. They didn't complain about anything. They just sat. And I thought this was barbarian. And I still think it's barbarian. And I think drugs are just as barbarian. They don't work practically ever, except in acute pain. It's fine. For a month, you can handle it. By six months, almost always drugs fail. I don't care whether it's a tranquilizer or a narcotic. They fail. Now, interestingly, back in the mid-90s, I did a survey of every medical board in the United States to get their opinion about the use of narcotics in, quote, chronic benign pain, non-cancer pain. 49 of 50 were highly against narcotic use in chronic pain. Shortly after that, OxyContin came on the market. Today, all medical boards push the use of narcotics in chronic pain. It's crazy. It doesn't work. I know you're 100 years old, but if you want to live to be 101, you've got to start taking care of yourself. Okay. <laughs> So conventional medicine, I think, is pretty darn good at diagnosis. We are excellent. Sometimes it takes a month or two, but we, we are good. We're phenomenal at technology. We're great at acute emergencies and trauma. Healthy pregnancy, of course, we don't have to do anything. It takes care of itself. We can postpone death until you have to go to the Supreme Court to decide whether you're dead or alive. And we can sustain some chronic illnesses, but not cure. Curing a chronic disease with conventional medicine is a rare, rare event. There was a paper published a couple of years called Premature Death. Well, here are the causes. Number one, a body mass index of 25 and above. Smoking, still 22% after 50 plus years, 60 years of the war against smoking. We've cut the incidence only 50%. The average American diet, which is beyond belief, 80% of all the food in this country is junk, in my opinion. I went to McDonald's in 1962. I took one bite. And I thought, oh my God. I spit it into the napkin, I threw it away, and I've never been back. I wouldn't even drink a cup of coffee at a, at a fast food restaurant because they load it, among other things. I suspect they even put it in the coffee, monosodium glutamate, which is dangerous for your brain. Inactivity. You know, only 10% of Americans get adequate exercise. Adequate meaning 30 minutes, five days a week. 10%. Now, if you take the top four here, only 3% of Americans have all of those habits. A huge study of 160,000 cross-study across the country. Only 3% had the four essential habits for health. Low vitamin D is rampant. And I'm beginning to believe that the low vitamin D is not just the fact that we live in modern caves. I have a feeling that some of the poisons that have been released into our environment, especially Roundup, 
which is now at 65% of rainfall <coughs> in the country, not to mention everywhere else. 300 million pounds of that poison in this country alone, one pound per person every year. I'm beginning to think some of those things interfere with our ability even to absorb vitamin D. Low nitric oxide, and then of course wheat, which has been the most prostituted food in history. When I was a child, before any of you were born, wheat had 13 genes. Wheat now has 52 genes. And Roundup. I don't eat wheat. I gave it up 10 years ago because it is the most poisoned food on the face of the earth today. And sugar, of course, never was a food. And these are the diseases of human misbehavior. High blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, most infection, most cancer, and activity. That's most diseases. And these are those essential habits. I mean, it's repetition, I realize. But the one that wasn't included in that big study, and there are equal studies about this one, is people who sleep less than seven hours on a regular basis are much more unhealthy. They, they are prone to all of these diseases. In fact, the number one thing that inadequate sleep does is weight gain, among others. So the holistic feel, which we created in 1978, basically is superb at stress management. That's what it's all about. Because even as early as 1900, Sir William Osler, known as the father of American medicine, published articles talking about stress as the cause of disease. Well, it's more of a cause of disease now than it was 100 years ago. Conventional medicine does almost nothing for educating people. And of course, what's the most common disease in the world? In my opinion, it is the combination of anxiety and depression. I believe from talking to thousands of people and actually doing little surveys in many audiences, 40% of Americans are clinically depressed and 40% have what I call a subclinical depressive miasma. You know, remember the character in Little Abner who, the, the uh, well, yes. And so it's, it's common. And we'll come to the cause of that in a bit. And, and really, we need to promote health. I don't care how long I live. I just want to be healthy until I drop dead. I don't want to dwindle. Changing habits. So, the biochemistry of health. DHE, if, if you want to know how healthy you are and how likely you're long, uh, uh, you're likely to, you know, stay reasonably healthy, just get a free DHE. Don't get a DHE sulfate. Ninety percent of your DHEA has a sulfate molecule. It's like testosterone. You can't use it. I don't know why we even bother measuring total testosterone. It's a free testosterone. It's the free DHEA that is essential. And by the way, there's only one lab I truly trust, and that's Nichols in Capistrano, California. I have tested blood at other labs, sending the same three samples of the same person's blood with different age. They vary about up to 300% on the same blood. Nichols is accurate. And I have measured this in, oh, at least 2,000 people, and I have never seen what I would call a healthy DHEA level in a patient with any illness whatsoever. The range, even according to Nichols, is like in a man, 180 to 1,200 nanograms of deciliter. Deciliter in a woman, it's 130 to 980 nanograms of deciliter. That's, that's a stupid range. Nothing is that broad. So I look at the upper half. So in men, 750 to 1,200. In women, uh, 550 to 980. That's a healthy level. I've never seen a patient with any disease, with a healthy level of DHEA. The problem with taking DHEA, which has been popular since the 80s, is if you're a woman, you have a 39% chance of having microscopic breast cancer. But if you live to be 90 or more years of age, you've got an 11% chance clinically of developing breast cancer. If you're a man and you live to be 100, you have a 100% chance of having microscopic prostate cancer. But you only have a 13% only, 
13% of developing it clinically. If you take DHEA, it upsets the balance between cortisol and DHEA. And it can cause that latent, which your weakened immune system was still managing, breast, ovary, prostate cancer to flare up. I don't think taking it is a good idea. So these are ways. Each of these four things will re raise your DHEA by itself 60%. When you put the four together, you can raise your DHEA an average of 250%. I've proven this in hundreds of people. Natural progesterone cream, actually my first study, my first intuitive hit was, well, you know, by age 50, most people are getting pretty low. Women stop making progesterone when they go through menopause. So I took men who were low in DHEA and I gave them natural progesterone. And they all became horny and everybody was happy except one wife. And, uh, but I've done it in many, many people since then. Turns out I've also worked with magnesium for almost 40 years and magnesium deficiency is rampant. And I used to give all of my patients up to two weeks IVs of magnesium. And it works to restore your magnesium level, but it doesn't raise DHEA. <laughs> Interestingly, if you put magnesium chloride on the skin, you can soak in it, lotion, however, it is absorbed. Within one month, you can restore your intracellular levels of magnesium and it raises DHEA 60%. It's good for all kinds of things because magnesium deficiency is associated, again, with every known disease. Not one, all. I put together something I call youth formula. It's Dr. Sheely's youth formula, not just mine, but um, it has a combination of 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C and 1,000 milligrams of MSM, methyl sulfonylmethane, a little bit of molybdenum and a little bit of beta-1,3 glucon. That combination, Neither one of them alone will do it. The combination will raise DHEA 60%. And of course, back in the mid-90s, I discovered a circuit in the body. I play with acupuncture and have since the 60s. I discovered a new circuit in the body which had to do with balancing what I call fire energy, and it's really related to DHEA. And it, it works, but it takes a special electrical stimulator, and it takes a minimum of 20 minutes a day to do it. And I found a lot of people won't spend 20 minutes to save their life. You know, remember that cartoon of the guy hanging on a twig on the side of a cliff? Help, God help. Let go, my son. Anybody else up there? No. <laughs> and, um, you know, people won't do it. So five years ago, I decided I've got to find another way, and I began to develop ways of stimulating these acupuncture systems with essential oils instead of needles or electricity. And the nice thing about that is in 30 seconds, you can do a complete circuit. People will sometimes spend 30 seconds. Now this again looks at, this is my concept of what DHEA is. Here you go. 100% of patients, in my experience, are below good. Again, you tell me you got any patient, any symptom, you're on any drug, you're gonna have a DHEA down there. 50% are in that big column, and 50% are actually in the truly deficient level. That's pretty serious. So the basic biochemistry, in my opinion, the one you can tell beyond any other doubt of how healthy you are, and to some extent how long you're gonna live is just a plain old free DHEA level. It is lower deficient all disease, it's associated with low magnesium, it represents what I call your stress reserves, should be the most abundant hormone in the human body, and free DHEA is essential. There are lots of other things that will help raise DHEA. We, we've studied these. We actually did a study where we drew the blood level and just had people laugh. Not with even a cartoon or a movie or whatever. 
Most people can't do that for 15 minutes. <laughs> it's good exercise, but five minutes of that will raise your DHEA. We, we proved that way back in the early 90s. Meditators, regular meditators, have higher levels of DHEA than non-meditators. Sex, people have sex on a regular basis. You know, not once a year, <laughs> twice a week at least. Etc. 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 People who spend time outside in the sun, a minimum of an hour a day, have higher levels of DHEA. And of course, then the magnesium release and these things that we already talked about. Now, in men, in general, I recommend they use Adam's Prostate Care instead of regular progesterone because men don't need 60 milligrams a day. Women do. Men need about 30 milligrams. So the company that makes the best. Uh, progesterone also makes what we call Adam's prostate. They have a little soft palmetto and some other things in it which are good for the prostate in addition to the, that. And of course then um, the, um, the ring of fire. So now clinically we have shown that stimulating this particular circuit raises DHEA. It reduces migraine in people who are having frequent migraines. I'm talking about one or more a week. 75%. There's not a drug in the world that's that good. It brings people out of depression only 70% of the time. Not bad. Diabetic neuropathy, 80% reduction in pain. There's not a medical thing in the world that works for diabetic neuropathy. A marked improvement in sensory loss just by stimulating the ring of fire. Rheumatoid arthritis, people who fail conventional medicine, 70%. One 16-year-old with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, totally asymptomatic within two weeks. There's nothing in conventional medicine that can compete with that. Weight loss with fire, or, with air or water, also, most people lose about a half pound a week. Not rapid, but Hey, halitosis, better no breath at all. <laughs> Can help restore the thyroid. And of course, it actually is for the entire endocrine system because it includes something in, well, when I put together the, the, the ring of fire, the circuit, it includes the entire Cheng Mo, which is a traditional Chinese thing for everything except the pituitary. We added that in the ring of fire. The Chinese didn't know about the pituitary. So these are the benefits. It restores DHEA. It is great for minimizing inflammation, you know, all those things. Not bad. These are the points, and we don't have time to go through those, but they're very specific points, and you need to be close to them. You know, without putting a needle in, you're putting on, at this point, an oil, so you're co covering a space about the size of your thumbnail. And so that's just a list of the rest of the points and some of the descriptions of them. Now, there are all kinds of other things that are useful. I'm concentrating today primarily on health, overall health and longevity, but I want to point out that from my point of view in dealing with patients, even though I'm concentrating today on both overall health and longevity, I consider past life therapy the most important tool I have learned since 1972. I want to talk to you more about that. <laughs> I uh, appreciate what you were saying last night. I believe that every significant illness represents unfinished business from a previous life. Beyond that, I call what I do now transcutaneous acupuncture. Now, when I did my first work on this, I sent the papers off to two organizations on some of my, and I, I said, called it something like, activation of acupuncture points with essential oils. I think they read the, read the title and sent it back. I then changed the name to transcutaneous acupuncture and both of them accepted the paper immediately. <laughs> You're gonna have sex in public square if you know what to call it. <laughs> it's 
So in order of importance, these are, I think, all kinds of tools that really represent the broad field of energy medicine and a holistic approach to things. And they're all important. Not all of them are as important for longevity. So the number two thing is calcitonin. You all know probably the common cause of death in people over the age of 80. Fractured hip. Well, osteoporosis. Most people, including men, have some degree of osteoporosis by the time they're in their mid-50s. The reason for that is, a, is complex. It's like lack of vitamin D, it's lack of adequate magnesium, it's lack of adequate boron, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But basically, it's inadequate calcitonin, which is another hormone made in the thyroid gland. And interestingly, when I received these rings, I guess this is a crowd I can talk about a little bit. Back in the beginning, my first interest was DHEA. And we did the progesterone, and it raised at 60%. But if you started at 180, and it raised 100%, you're still not very good. So I sat down one day and I said, what else can I do to raise DHEA? And the voice comes, the voice that I occasionally hear. I hope there's no psychiatrist in the room. That's not um, I, I have a guide. And, and when he's instructing me, it's always Norman. But if he's just we're having a friendly conversation, it's Norm. But, you know. Well, Norman, if you would stimulate the points that connect the kidneys with the gonads, with the adrenal glands, with the thyroid and the pituitary through a one of the sky point, it'll raise DHEA. I said, yeah, but there's no point for the pituitary. He said, well, find one. He doesn't give me everything, you know. So I found it, and it worked. And so time goes by, and another one comes, and that was the next one was the ring of air, which I'm putting later because it's not part of essential longevity, and then the ring of water, and then came the ring of earth. And he said, this is for recreation of the human body. Now, he doesn't give me everything. He just gives me a hint sometimes. And so I thought, recreation of the human body. Well, maybe it's growth hormone, you know? Maybe it's one of the interleukins. When he's stupid, it's got to be calcitonin because we are not amoeba. We've got a skeleton. Our body is created around a skeleton. So overnight, I proved that stimulating this particular circuit will raise calcitonin levels. And calcitonin not only is essential for your bones, and we have done a year-long study in reversing osteoporosis with it, it is the strongest pain reliever the body produces is stronger than beta endorphin in reducing pain. So it has many benefits. So it's essential for bone integrity. And you've got to have some kind of thyroid function for it to work well. Well, we can do it with electricity, but again, we're talking about 21 minutes. People won't do it. But with Earth Bliss, you could do it in 30 seconds. Then we get to the third, which is equally important, and that is free radicals. Free radicals, of course, are the things that I call rust the body. They wear us out. They destroy the body. Eventually, they kill us. Now, I've been looking at ways to reduce free radicals for well over 10 years, 15, 20. And I found one about 12 years ago where we used some strong concentrate of a psi berry, and I thought that was pretty good, 43% reduction in free radicals. The ring of crystal reduces free radicals 80%. There's nothing close to that in the literature. I have tried even 100 grams of vitamin C IV. Doesn't do it. All of the antioxidants alone Interestingly, they, they raise antioxidant levels, but they don't reduce free radicals as well. We've carried people for 18 months reducing free radicals by just simple 30 seconds a day putting on Crystal Bliss. I had already proven several years ago that electrical stimulation of these five, three circuits, that's an hour a day, 
would reduce free radicals and raise DHEA and raise calcitonin. But nobody's going to spend an hour. I wouldn't spend an hour a day doing it except in a research project, you know? But we converted three years ago to using the oils on the rings. And in a maximum of one and a half minutes a day, you can raise your telomere length 3.5%. On average, your telomeres, the tips of your DNA, shrink 1% every year of life if you have good health habits. If you don't have those good health habits we talked about, they shrink a lot faster. That's why the average person doesn't live to be 100. They live to be 78, average. And a few people manage to get into the mid-teens. Obviously, there's those slight genetic and other variables. But I know of nothing that will regenerate your telomeres as well as stimulating these circuits, three of them. I have now 49 people we have proven we can regenerate telomeres. My telomeres at 83 years of age are 35 years younger than my chronological age. Not bad. So telomeres are the single best measurement, but it's a kind of expensive test, $450. There's only one good lab in North America it's in Vancouver, repeat diagnostics, plural. And I've done hundreds of them there now. There are a couple of labs in this country and one in Spain that has an office in Virginia. Don't waste your money on them. Uh, if you want to know the name, I, I don't want to put it on tape, but I'll tell you the ones I wouldn't do in this country because they're not good. I've, I've tested them. I've tested the one in Spain. I wouldn't waste 600 bucks on it again. But repeat diagnosis, I have no financial interest in it. It is good. And that's how we measure telomeres. And we're measuring both the lymphocytes and the granulocytes, both the major categories of white blood cells, because they represent your body's overall telomere length better than any other single organ, because they're replaced so frequently. So telomeres are the single best measurement. Now, I am often asked, what is the number one requirement for health? And my routine answer is attitude, because your attitude determines your health habits. Whether you choose, you see, I'm sort of a fanatic about health. I always have been. In fact, I've been on supplements since I was conceived. My mother was a freak in this kind of way as well. Now, she only lived 97 years, but that's not too bad. And <clears throat> um, feeling okay, I want to go into this in some depth because this is the basic problem that creates all diseases, in my opinion. It is low self-esteem, not feeling adequately good about yourself. <clears throat> and you choose. If I know something's unhealthy, I don't have a problem. I am not an addictive personality. Now, if you want to know how to get rid of addiction, we can talk about that another way. But the point is, it's, it's a choice. And we know 50% of people have no trouble quitting smoking. The other 50% are true addicts, and they have a horrible time quitting. But I can help them if they want to quit. If they don't want to quit, you couldn't force it. In my opinion, there's only one purpose in being alive to help other people. That's, that's what we're here for. And on the other hand, your primary responsibility is take care of yourself so you're not a drag on everybody else. That's the way I look at it. And I don't want to be a drag. Again, I don't mind dying. My kids have been told uh, that if they call and leave a message and I don't reply, don't bother coming over with a minimum of a week. Because if I've sort of fallen and I can't take care of myself, yeah, I want to go. I don't want any 
fantastic things to try to keep me alive at that point. I'll haunt you if you don't let me in. They know that too. So oxytocin deficiency is found in all known diseases, except, I don't know what you call it, a disease or truly a soul deficit. The only exception is narcissistic psychopathic behavior. They run a high level of oxytocin. All, they're so in love with their blank selves that nothing else matters. But every other known disease, depression, anxiety, autism, ADHD, addiction, schizophrenia, every one of them, heart disease, hypertension, cancer, diabetics, all of them have low levels of oxytocin. The number one, DHEA is the most important and the most prominent as far as longevity is concerned, but right behind it is oxytocin. Because by the time you get a low DHEA, you're also getting a low of oxytocin. Now, in 1972, I first heard about autogenic training and biofeedback. This was actually before Elmer published his first paper on the use of biofeedback in, high blood, in, in uh, migraine and later hypertension. And I learned about autogenic training. And there's no question, there's more scientific research behind this one self-regulation tool than all others. As of 1969, there were six volumes, books, with 2,600 scientific references. The last time I looked, about a month ago, there were over 17,000 scientific references on the scientific benefits of autogenic training. There are other ways that work, but there's nothing any better. The problem is getting people to do it. Now, these are all energizers in general, happiness, even laughing, whether you want to or not. Good food, exercise, sleep, nitric oxide. Now, interestingly, most people make adequate nitric oxide, which is one of the essential chemicals for keeping your energy level in every cell in your body until about age 40. And sometime between age 40 and 50, almost everybody loses the ability to convert L-arginine into nitric oxide because the muscles need the L-arginine to keep your muscles from falling apart. It's just a metabolic change. Unless you're going to eat a quart of beets a day, which are the best single food for raising your nitric oxide, there's this little product called Nitro Extreme, which requires 15 to a maximum of 30 drops twice a day. It works remarkably well for raising nitric oxide, controlling blood pressure, increasing the warning woody, and a few other things. There are other things like uh, N-acetylcysteine, acetyl-L-carnitine, ashwagandha, and you know Korean ginger, uh, ginseng. All of these can help energy and they're useful, and they're safe. These are the energy zappers, all the obvious things. Every one of the artificial sweeteners, among other things, actually is harmful. I've, we've known that trans fats are harmful for 60 plus years, and they're still there. They're poison. You can't metabolize them. They increase the risk of atherosclerosis. So basically, all of these things are essential to avoid. And back in 74, when I, you know, knew nothing, actually, you know, I'm a neurosurgeon. I went through medical school, I went through neurosurgical residency, and I actually was interested in neurosurgery because I really was interested in the mind. And I thought being a neurosurgeon was the best way to find out. Neurosurgeons are interested in the mind, they're interested in the brain. And I love the brain, and I love the whole pathology and handling it, but I didn't know anything. The worst course I ever took in my life in medical school was psychiatry. It was abominable. On the final exam, they asked, list five characteristics of a good psychiatrist. 
I wrote crazy as hell five times. <laughs> I was called in. They threatened to flunk me. And I said, would you like me in this blank, and I didn't use the word blank course again next year. I don't remember if I got a B or an A. It doesn't matter. They didn't dare flunk me. And I haven't changed my mind. I consider 99% of psychiatrists sicker than any patient they ever take care of. Not all. This is our exceptions. But I went back to, to get a PhD in psychology, and I wanted to find out what else will work other than biofeedback and autogenic training. And so I studied for several years the world literature and everything I could find on self-control, essentially. And basically, autogenic training is talking to the body. And one thing that wasn't talked about is, and I had determined this in my patients, most people who have a problem, pain or otherwise, or dysfunction, actually hate that part of the body. They're lucky if they don't hate the whole body. But you can't afford the luxury of hating a part of your body. You have to treat it as if it's a beloved child. And so learning to focus love on it. And then there's an American Indian technique from the Northwest Indian Nez Perce group. Preparation for meditation. Collect undesired whatever. Stress, tension, pain, discomfort. Like a gentle vacuum. Like, uh, Loving vacuum cleaner, suck it up, get rid of it. You can get rid of it. I was doing a workshop a, a few weeks ago, and a woman in the had a severe headache in her left forehead. For me, I walked over and I just had her do that for a few minutes, got rid of her headache. It's a powerful tool for getting rid of pain. Edmund Jacobson published his book, I think, 1929, Progressive Relaxation. It's still just as good today as it was then. 80% of stress illnesses can be controlled with progressive relaxation. And then, Willem Reich felt that all disease was the result of a decrease in blood flow to the organ. And actually, there's one study that proves he was right. A gynecologist in Carmel in the 70s demonstrated that women who were non-orgasmic had a cold vagina the temperature well below the rectal temperature. And they used temperature biofeedback, you know, a tampon with a thermometer in it, to raise vaginal temperature, and with no psychotherapy, they became orgasmic, just by increasing blood flow. So decreasing blood flow to a given organ can be extremely helpful, but you never want to do it inside your head, because that dilates the blood vessel that can cause a headache. Anywhere else is okay. And then we are electrical beings. So if you can imagine circulating the electrical energy in a systematic way, a powerful tool for gaining control over sensations. And one of the most powerful for all pain is expanding the electromagnetic energy field. Now, this is one I created back in the early 70s. And, and it's an interesting story because... The man who first exposed me to past life therapy started an induction, and he would say, expand your feet one inch, and then he would say, expand your ankles. Well, it never occurred to me to expand my body, but since I've always seen energy, I immediately thought of it as the electromagnetic field. But when I started talking to my patients, I would say, expand your feet one inch, and I wasn't, I, I wasn't really talking about it, but that's what he said. Patients hated it. Expanding the body one inch and then 12 inches, they didn't like it at all. I said, no, no, you're not expanding the physical body. You're expanding the energy field. You want the halo, the aura, the envelope, the capsule. And when you put yourself into a 12 inch, one inch first, the 12 inch capsule of electromagnetic energy, the body becomes anesthetic. I'm, I'm serious. You, your mind is awake, but you're floating in space. There's no feeling in the body. In fact, in 1976, when I went to the Philippines, the only time in my life I've ever had a significant problem like this, I developed a sinus infection. It became pan-sinusitis. Every sinus in my head was clogged. And they had to do a fenestration of the senoid sinus. 
Now, I know all about fenestrations of the sphenoid sinus. I introduced in this country the idea of taking out the pituitary through the nose, transphenoidal. And I don't like anesthesia. And so I said to the anesthesiologist, give me 20 minutes. I'll be ready. So 20 minutes later, I said, okay, I'm ready. Now, I could feel them cutting and crunching bone, going, not feeling the pain. I could feel the movement and hear the bone crunch, but no pain. Total anesthesia without any drugs. Not bad. It's a great technique. And, of course, then you add imagery to this. And these are ways for controlling your whole physiology. So these are the adjuncts. And of course, again, I consider transcutaneous acupuncture one of the most important. And all of these are important, but I want to get to some very important. I don't have time to do all of these, so we'll move forward. Ah, I consider it the most important innovation in 4,000 years in acupuncture because it takes so little time and it works. And the, I'm sorry? What is it? It's the use of essential oils, specific essential oils, on specific acupuncture points. And I want to give you one more of those because really, I want to come back down to oxytocin. That is another of the rings. And it may not be essential for longevity because it looks as if DHEA, calcitonin, and free radicals are the key. I have a feeling, and I haven't looked at this, that if you have normal DHEA, normal calcitonin, and low free radicals, you've probably got adequate oxytocin also. But I haven't looked at that particular correlation. I think the question in his mind, most of us think of acupuncture as needles. Yeah, well, this is not... You put, in, you put a, an oil in a roll-on bottle into a point, twist it, and move on to the next point. A maximum of two seconds per point. You can't do that as quickly, practically, with a needle. So the ring of air is another of these. And what it does, according to my guide when he gave it to me, it leads to, quote, simultaneity of thought. Now, to me, that meant intuition. And again, he gave me no instructions other than, you know, there's this circuit and you might find these points. And I had to figure out what the points are. He'd give me a sort of a location, but I had to. And so I said to my nurse, you know, we've got to find out what it does. And she says, what do you want to measure? I said, neurotensin out of my mouth. Had no idea what neurotensin was. Call the lab, see if they could measure neurotensin. They could. My neurotensin went up 600%. So for a number of years, well, neurotensin, I, I looked at, oh, by the way, talk about synchronicity, simultaneity of thought. I've never done drug research on people. I just don't like drugs enough to do it. But back in 64, I did some of the original animal research on the effects of ketamine, the first modern neuroleptic. And neurotensin is the original spontaneous neuroleptic, a detachment. In other words, who the hell cares? That's what neurotensin is. It's total detachment. Well, five years ago, out of the blue, I thought, you know, I think it must raise oxytocin. It came just as spontaneously as most of my things do. I spent hours on the internet and I found a single paper that said when neurotensin is released, it releases oxytocin. Aha. So they went back and rechecked the ring of air and it raises oxytocin. For instance, two years ago, I was doing one of my frequent studies. I had two people come in for the study, both of whom had zero levels of oxytocin in the blood. Adults, 50s years old. Within 30 minutes of applying air bliss, one man went up to 10.6, the normal range is 5 to 18, and the woman went up to 5.8. I mean, that's remarkable. And we've now proven 
that 80% of people with depression and anxiety can be brought out of it with air lifts. So it's phenomenal in autism. My favorite story is a 12-year-old kid who was so autistic, I couldn't get within three feet of him. Two months later, he came in and hugged me. I had an eight-year-old, an eight-year-old autistic kid who spoke 50 words. Three weeks later, he spoke 450 words. Three months later, you couldn't shut him up. <laughs> but, but I mean, that's how powerful this is. And interestingly, tinnitus, which is very difficult to control, can be controlled remarkably well when you use air plus fire. But it takes about three months. So it restores oxytocin. That's the critical factor, is restoring oxytocin. The bonding, the nurturing, the anxiety-reducing hormone, which is great for overcoming stress. So I don't know whether if you do fire, earth, and crystal, it raises oxytocin. I suspect it may. You know, these, these uh, little research projects cost a fair amount of money. I mean, one little study will cost me fifteen to twenty thousand dollars, and so I I haven't looked to see whether if you do fire, earth, and crystal, it will raise oxytocin because air does it. So I'm not going to do that anytime soon. Nevertheless, if I only had one thing to do with people, more important in my opinion than longevity is happiness. You know, happiness is a truly an inside job. And so for the 80% of people who are not happy, I really think that rather than worrying about their telomeres, they need to worry about their oxytocin. And I consider that probably, for the average person on the street, the most important thing they can do. And I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who give me, I've got the studies with the lab tests, but I get every week two or three emails from people telling me some miraculous thing that's taken place with their using this particular thing. So the Ring of Air has another specific point of uh, 13 points. And the important thing is it should begin at conception. The mother should be happy and, oh God, I'm pregnant. If she's not, she can go through nine months of being totally depressed, anxious, at birth, if she was happy for nine months, if she's put to sleep or has a final anesthetic, it totally blocks the most important oxytocin grounding, which is labor itself. It, it stops making, she stops making oxytocin. Even if the birth was happy and, and the pregnancy was happy, if there is a major trauma in the first seven years of life, it can block oxytocin forever. In that 30,280 people that I have worked with who are chronically depressed, almost every one of them will tell me they've never been happy. Many of them tell me it took place in early childhood when the parents were divorced, things like that. So, a happy, nurturing childhood. And although, yes? So if that blocks it completely, then is there any hope for? The hope, well, the hope is at least 80% of the time we can restore it with air bliss. Now, you can also do it with intranasal sprays of oxytocin, but it takes four times a day. It's, it, the body loves it so much, you know, you give, inject it, it's gone in five minutes. That's how much the body loves oxytocin. Nasal sprays may last two or three hours. But you can't spray something, you, the, the studies have all been like one to three months max. You can't spray something in the nose four times a day for the rest of your life. But you can certainly put on air bliss for the rest of your life. That's the way I look at it. So the important thing is... Can I ask one other question? I'm sorry? You said earlier about past life and how important that was. Yes. If people resolve something about that issue, then does it make a difference? That's a great question. Uh, I don't know. 
it makes a difference in their happiness, so I assume they somehow restore the body's ability to make some oxytocin because, again, I've done hundreds of past life therapy sessions with people, and sometimes it's, it's, it's near, let me give you just one. It's, it's actually my favorite past life story. It was a 26 or eight year old woman came in paralyzed with severe pain despite her total paralysis. She gave a history of being of shooting herself accidentally with her husband's gun while she was cleaning it. So I did her past life therapy. We go through, this is late 72. She gives me a story that sounds like Anne Boleyn right up to her head rolling when the guillotine hit her. Now whether she was Anne Boleyn or not doesn't matter. So we finish. Of all the hundreds I've done, it's the only one who's ever been amnesic. She didn't remember one thing she had said. She was in a deep trance. Fortunately, I recorded it. I play it back. Okay, Lily, what does this mean? She starts crying. She said, I don't know. I said, well, I know. You just told me you think your husband shot you. She says, I awoke after surgery and was told I had shot myself accidentally cleaning my husband's gun. The last thing I remember is we were having an argument. So she didn't get rid of her paralysis, but she got rid of her husband and pain went away. <laughs> and so, uh, I mean, and I have numerous cases of pain disappearing immediately after a successful past life therapy session. So I think you can, I'm obviously if I get stimulated, in 30 minutes, by putting an oil on, the body has the capacity, it's just blocked. <coughs> so, basically, health and habits, happiness, and ultimately, all of these are related to longevity. So if I had only one choice for people, it would be make them happy at least. And they're more likely to choose good health habits then. But if they really want longevity, I think it's worthwhile restoring all of them. So, I'm, I will leave time for questions with that. Yes. Um, you have down there high protein, low carb diet essential. Yes. What, in your uh, astute opinion, is a good source of high protein that's healthy? I consider, in general, healthy raised flesh food good. Unfortunately, there is no complete essential amino acid food in the vegetable community. The number one deficient amino acid in people is taurine. The amino acid L-taurine is essential. It is synergistic with magnesium to balance the electrical charge on your cells. 84% of people with chronic depression are deficient in taurine. A majority of epileptics who have uncontrolled epilepsy are deficient in taurine and magnesium. There is no taurine in any known vegetable protein. And so I, I like to tease in my snotty way, vegetarians, true vegans, because you, you can't live without one animal product, vitamin B12. I like to point out that although vitamin B12 is made in yeast, yeast is an animal, it's not a plant. And I have seen many vegans deficient in B12, and a lot of them deficient in taurine. So although some vegetable protein is okay, it's not adequate. You're not gonna get B12, you're not gonna get taurine. So personally, I think eggs, dairy products, if you, you know, unless you have a true allergy to them, are fine. Uh, but fish, meat, um, I happen to live on a farm, have for 45, six years. I raise most of my own vegetables and a lot of my fruits, but I like healthy raised meat as well. So any meat, I don't care if it's fowl, beef, lamb, pork, meat, not a lot, only about four ounces a day of some kind, I consider one of the essentials. Now I have to admit, I don't have meat every day, probably five days a week. <laughs> but eggs and cheese will substitute on those other days. And the problem is the hidden carbohydrates. I mean, I don't know 
There may be, but I don't know a box cereal, for instance, which I would bring into my house because they all have sugar and all kinds of other artificial things in them. Uh, I'm not opposed to cereal grains like oats. and I mean, I love yellow grits. White grits to me are pretty blah, but yellow grits have a little flavor in themselves. Um, in general, it's the artificial sweeteners, not just sugar, which is clearly not a food, but fructose and all of those derivatives. And the evidence is overwhelming that people who use the, art, the synthetic sweeteners actually are harming themselves because they are addicted to sweet. And the evidence is overwhelming that t using artificial sweetness does not help you lose weight. Uh, there seems to be an increase of people that are having thyroid issues, be it hypo or hyper. Yeah, I think that the thyroid epidemic <laughs> began with chlorination of water, aggravated by fluoridation of water, and severely aggravated by nuclear energy, radioactivity. The thyroid cannot distinguish between mainly fluoride and iodine in making triiodothyronine, thyroid hormone. So you can have three fluoride molecules attached to your tyrosine and the chemistry test looks as if your T3 is normal. If your body temperature, when you're out of bed, three hours or more, is below 98.6, you're hypothyroid. I don't care what else, I don't care what the blood test show, you're hypothyroid. Now, if you're drinking fluoridated water, the chances are you're not gonna be able to take care of that very well, so you need to give up fluoridated water. Then you need to stimulate the ring of fire because that's part of the chung mo for the thyroid gland and you need to take thyroid, uh, iodine. You know, when iodine deficiency was discovered in the 20s, the requirement was 150 micrograms a day. I did a study in the mid 90s on a whole bunch of people in my clinic who were hypothyroid. All of them had low temperature and we gave them 1,500 micrograms a day. My temperature, by the way, was 97. I didn't realize it. I had no symptoms. I used to brag about the fact that, that I could go to a sauna and didn't need a towel because I didn't sweat. But that was my only symptom, and I didn't think it was a symptom. So I, I found out that I require a minimum of 900 micrograms a day. My temperature will go back down. So for average person, I recommend they take one 12.5 milligram capsule of iodine a week and stimulate the ring of fire. And most people within a month or six weeks will restore normal uh, thyroid function. They, because the thyroid is reproduced to some extent daily. And if they'll give up, give up the fluoride and add the iodine and the ring of fire, many people can restore it. How would you treat chronic fatigue syndrome and Lyme disease? Chronic fa oh, chronic fatigue, oh, that's easy. I'm serious. Again, I would say in the mid-90s at the latest, my guide said, when, you know, Norman, you're going to begin to see increasing number of people who have an electrical system that's not working well. I call it, electro I call it electromagnetic dysthymia. So all of those diseases that fit into that broad category, basically their electrical system is shot. If you look at their EEG, a computerized EEG, 100% of them have an abnormal EEG. 60% of the time they have a focus of hyperactivity in the right frontal lobe. The other 40% they can, but there's some part of the brain that's, that's hyperactive. All kinds of other abnormalities, low magnesium, low, seven amino acids deficient often. Single most important is magnesium lotion. Second is the, the cranial stimulator, the LIS, L-I-S-S. -S. Now it's now so, because he's dead, they bought the patent and changed the name. Fisher Wallace, F-I-S-H-E-R-W-A-L-L-A-C-E. -E. Um, I discovered this back in 75, and it helps to restore serotonin mechanism. 
you know, the number one um, hormone or neurochemical related to mood is serotonin. I call it the bright-eyed, bushy-tail wake-up chemical. Because it, when you wake up in the morning, if you wake up the way I do, woo-hoo, another day, your serotonin goes like this. And I, you know, <clears throat> type A personalities are a, a lot more serotonin than type Bs. And I have been accused of being a type A personality. I don't care. But my serotonin, the first time we used the list cranial stimulator, it was a good level to start with. It went up to five times the upper limit of normal. Now, the average person doesn't get that great a boost. My medical assistant, uh, physician, assistant, uh, physician partner at the time was a type B, and his only doubled. Uh, but it does raise serotonin and beta endorphin, we learned later, of course. So the list cranial stimulator is essential. Magnesium uh, is essential. And basically, those, those are the most critical things. If they will take up autogenic training, now it takes three months to retrain the nervous system in a person that bad. They got to do all of this stuff for about three months, whereas with the average just depressed person, I can do it within a few weeks. But those are the critical things. If you go to my website, there's um, resources, and there's a link there called Optimal Health. And under Optimal Health, you'll find all my recommendations for a wide variety of things, including uh, electromagnetic dysthymia, cancer, et cetera. Lyme disease? Same thing. I consider Lyme a, a gain. It, it's just as reactive. Now, obviously, they had to have had antibiotics for at least a month at some point. But after a year, a year's worth of antibodies will not cure Lyme disease. It has to be a restoration of the normal electrical system. And that works with electromagnetic dysthymia. When you're talking about electromagnetics, um, are you also including things like uh, Rife machines and zappers and TENS machines? What's your opinion of those? Well, I invented TENS, so obviously. <laughs> I'm slightly prejudiced. Yeah, I think they're all, all positive. Uh, my favorite this year is pulsed electromagnetic fields therapy. And I've been exploring that for the last several years. And it's a very low, you know, like 10 to 20 um, micro Tesla. I mean, a very low energy and low frequency generally between zero and 100 hurts, but there are different wave patterns and stuff, and they are quite effective for diabetic neuropathy and, and pain as well. Okay, thank you.